Hello everyone, Zico Callahan with Raptor Chatter here, and I'm going to first point out that you don't see my cabinet with the fossils behind me because my wife and I are moving so that I can go to university. However, hopefully we'll have that set up in the next few months. As for the subject matter, we're going to be going into June 2019 in paleontology. Some dinosaurs had very strange feet. The Tyrannosaurs had a bone in the foot that pinched up to become very narrow, and this helped them in long distance running. The raptor dinosaurs, such as Velociraptor, had the iconic sickle claw that they could use to help grapple onto prey while hunting. This meant that the dromaeosaurs essentially would just run on two toes while the other would be lifted up and above. However, now there's a dinosaur found coming from South America that used only one toe when it ran. Vespersaurus paranesis was a species of alibosauroid, more closely related to animals like Carnotaurus than to the raptors, such as Velociraptor or Deinonychus. It had the unique adaptation of raising up the two flanking toes on each foot and running on only the larger singular middle toe on each foot, making it functionally monopedal, using only one toe. While this is the first time this has been found directly in a dinosaur, there has been some trace evidence that suggested this type of behavior, coming from not too far away. A slightly older formation of rocks nearby showed trackways which contained tracks that appear to have only one toe being used, indicating that a slightly older relative of Vespersaurus may have lived in the area, and in a very similar environment, as both of these formations, the one where the track comes from and where Vespersaurus was found, are very scrubland, deserty types of environments. While the exact reason for the dinosaur becoming monopedal isn't known, it does indicate that there's a lot of variety in the dinosaurs that we don't necessarily know about, and how even looking at trackways, we can start to understand different things that we may find better clues to later in the fossil record. The Cambrian explosion is famous for giving rise to many of the complex forms of life that we see even to this day. Its exact cause hasn't always been known though. A new paper, however, suggests an earlier cause to the Cambrian explosion, coming from the Ediacarian period. The paper suggests that during the Ediacarian, there were large volcanic arcs being formed by plate tectonics. When two plates of oceanic crust meet, one will begin to sink. It will then begin to melt and rise up as magma, causing volcanic arcs to form as that magma reaches the surface and becomes lava. This process can be seen today in places like the Aleutian chain in Alaska or in the Philippines, where subduction causes large volcanoes to arise. The production of these types of volcanoes during the Ediacarian period would have been much greater than that of today, and the eruptions from these volcanoes would have released nutrients into much of the water supply, and this then would have caused an increase in the amount of photosynthesis and oxygen being produced, therefore allowing larger animals to begin evolving, as there is more oxygen for them to begin attaining a larger body size. While it isn't definite, it is a good step and educated guess towards what exactly caused the Cambrian explosion, and how life began to reach the many complicated forms it has today. Large birds such as the moas of New Zealand and the elephant birds of Madagascar did quite well up until human arrival on the respective islands. However, earlier humans still interacted with large birds, specifically Pachystruthio dimanisensis a new species of fossil bird coming from the Crimea region of Ukraine. The time in which Pachystruthio lived in mainland Europe coincides with the arrival of some of the earliest humans to the continent, meaning that it very likely interacted with humans, potentially as a food source for them. And when we talk about this predator-prey dynamic, we need to understand that Pachystruthio was not a predator, like the earlier terror birds of South America but rather it was much more closely related to animals like the modern day ostrich, meaning that it would have been much more likely to have been predated upon by early humans, rather than the other way around. Jurassic Park has instilled and promoted the idea in many people that we can get DNA from fossils if only they are preserved well enough. And a new study presents that that may be true, but not necessarily the DNA we're looking for. Instead, the DNA that some scientists have been able to find is that of bacteria. Bacteria living in the soil where many fossils are found is free to move through it. However, it risks more damage from things like acid rain and the elements if it remains in the soil. 
That's where a slightly harder dinosaur bone can provide a refuge for it. This means any DNA that we find from dinosaur bones is much more likely to be that of the bacteria, and a false positive as to being true dinosaur DNA. With this in mind, we need to be very, very, very understanding that dinosaur DNA likely won't survive the fossilization process. It's just too old. DNA is designed to fall apart and part of the self-replicating process that all animals need to function. That also means that once the animal dies, one of the first things that DNA does is fall apart. Because of this, it's much more likely that any traces of DNA we find in dinosaur bones are that of the bacteria that have moved into the bones seeking refuge. I will go on to continue to say that some more modern fossils, such as those of some mammoths and giant ground sloths, do still contain DNA because they fossilized much more recently and the full decay of the DNA hasn't had enough time to take place. And that'll be important going into our next article. So sloths are weird. There's the two-toed sloths and the three-toed sloths that are found today. And while they are superficially very similar, being slow-moving tree-climbing animals, they really aren't that closely related. And that's something we've known for a long time. The closest known relatives that we know of to each of the respective tree sloths are different genera of ground sloth, separated by many millions of years of evolution. However, a new study suggests that what we had thought they were set up as isn't exactly accurate. Now, the two modern tree sloths are still very much separated, but the groups that they're most closely attached to and related to have changed. And this is because we've been able to look at the DNA of many of the fossilized ground sloths and modern sloths in order to make a more accurate family tree for this group. And so this has thrown a lot of our understanding for the evolution of sloths out the window. As we begin to understand with better evidence what exactly happened that led to some ground sloths becoming tree sloths. And with the graphic from the paper showing this, just how much change there was among these groups, just based on DNA evidence. And so, if it is possible that DNA from animals, especially the ones that are more modernly preserved, it can help our understanding of their evolution, and potentially causes of extinction, as we can begin to compare which species today are doing well, and which ones they are most closely related to that have already gone extinct. Modern hyenas live in Africa, but they once ranged much further than that, particularly the Kesmaperthetes, which were running hyenas having a much straighter back and longer back legs than our modern day hyenas. These animals were built more like a cheetah than our modern hyenas, and could be found across Eurasia and even as far as Arizona and even further south into Mexico. They were quite successful animals for their time. In order to get into North America, these hyenas crossed the Bering Land Bridge, a bridge which formed as the Ice Age worsened. As the glaciers expanded across the continents, they would take in and freeze some of the sea ice, lowering sea levels and revealing the land bridge that is now covered between Alaska and Russia. As for the hyenas, it's been thought that they moved through the northern parts of the area fairly quickly, but a new fossil shows that they were there for at least some time. And how long that is, we don't know. The fossil that was found that shows that they were this far north in what is now the Yukon Territory of Canada was found many decades ago and resided in one of the Canadian museums until its rediscovery this past year. After a description, it becomes more clear that that site may be more able to provide more evidence that hyenas stayed there, and whether they stayed there for a longer time, or were just simply passing through the area, moving south to warmer climates where they may have been better adapted. Understanding the arm movements of dinosaurs, and particularly theropods, can be very important for understanding how flight evolved. In order to better understand the arm movements of the early dinosaurs, researchers looked at one of the best preserved and largest of the early theropods coming from the early Jurassic, Dilophosaurus weatherly. Some of the postulation and ideas for the flapping motion of modern birds has come from the idea that early theropods and some of the later Solurosaurs would use their hands to snatch prey out of the air or off the ground, reaching forward and that being adapted into the flight motion. This new research, though, suggests that Dilophosaurus did not use its hands in that way, rather primarily using its mouth when it was hunting, and just using its arms and hands to clutch prey close to the chest in order to control it, rather than actively hunting using its arms. The authors do hold some caveats, though. 
particularly that this Dilophosaurus was injured before it died. In fact, there's an entire paper on just the injuries of this Dilophosaurus. And to read directly from the paper, the petrified pectoral limbs are peppered with a plethora of paleopathological peculiarities that point to a plentitude of potentially painful problems that plagued the poor prehistoric predator. Which, while on one hand, yes, is just a bit of fun alliteration for the authors, also is something that is noted about the specimen, that one of the arms was very, very badly damaged, and had a number of broken bones that had partially healed or not healed at the time of death. The authors do also point out that Dilophosaurus had a significantly less flexible elbow joint than those of animals such as the Solurosaurus, some of which would eventually evolve into the birds. This shows that not all dinosaurs would have had the ability to evolve into something resembling our modern day birds. Rather, it took the Solurosaurus evolution to take that very derived trait, which is that flexible elbow, to begin attaining flight and beginning to become more bird-like. Trilobites are a very commonly found fossil because for a long part of Earth's history, they were pretty much everywhere. However, where exactly they evolved from and which animals they are most closely related to has been up for debate. Many have suggested that they were closely related to animals such as horseshoe crabs and the Eurypterids, both of which were very closely related to the arachnids. However, a new study of trilobite eyes suggests otherwise. A new study looking at trilobite eyes shows that they aren't that similar to the eyes of animals like the horseshoe crabs, but rather they're much more similar to animals such as the lobsters and other crustaceans. This would put the trilobites in the group Mandibulata, again much closer to crustaceans, and then the, eventually the insects. This month has gone to show that very small pieces of evidence, such as the DNA of certain ground sloths or just some eye cones in a trilobite fossil, can help revolutionize and better our understanding of the natural world. Just because a find is big and grand, like that of Vespersaurus, which is a very unique dinosaur, doesn't mean that we should overlook other types of fossils that are smaller. All right, everyone, it's been a while getting this out. Again, we're moving, so hopefully we'll be able to keep up with getting these out, getting everything sorted. It's nice not being in the greater Phoenix area where it's 114 degrees Fahrenheit right now. And so that, again, still moving, so we'll be getting out and getting our own place eventually and having our normal setup and hopefully get something a little better set up for recording depending on what we find too. Because I know there were some audio issues in the old house. Be safe. Take care of each other. And uh, let's not go extinct. <laughs>